present us with some subjects that we can draw from. I see. Well, um, I just got a pack of cards here with answers on. You did? That's no. fantastic. <laughs> that that would have been a good set idea. For a good conversation. Um, maybe I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Thomas Winterberg, and I... I, I oh, you make dogme. Well, you're yes. part of the dogme crowd, yeah? That's right. Sort of. I'm, I'm one of the brethren. Are you still, I mean, quite assiduously a part of that, dogme? Uh, yes, well, it's a kind of church, isn't it? Which, I know. Which you can leave for a while. Well, it's an it? ironic church, yeah, I'm not so sure. I mean, how seriously do they take this? Oh, uh, that's a very different, difficult question. Uh, it's, in a way, very solemn. Yeah. And in another way, uh, it's a game. Yeah, can I get the impression from reading La what Last has said about it that it's, there's a lot of satire behind the whole thing as well? Yeah, but you know, that's just that a way to cover yourself, isn't it? It, it was meant quite seriously. Uh -huh. And it was the, the most um, inspiring thing I've tried in my young life. I think it's. Uh, whether or not there's a school of film, it will prove to be substantial, I don't know, but I think what it did do is uh, pull a lot of independent film into the forefront again. Yeah. Per se, I mean, overall. I, I, I seem to see a lot of uh, interest in more independent style movies since the advent of Dogma, in a way. It sort of re realigned the playing field a little bit, take the emphasis off yeah. finished Hollywood movie and back onto things that are more homemade, you know? For us, it was a kind of necessity, you know, making f the film industry and the f filmmaking today, I guess, is the most conservative art form. Is Next to music, I think. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's We're very possible. similar. We come from very similar worlds, you know. I mean, there's, there's a, the big industry push for both there's, industries. There's a lot of things that you used to do and it's a trapping yeah. and a claustrophobic feeling yeah. and uh, in order to break free of it we kind of had to stand together and make rules for it and go say, back to a very to a very naked beginning no, I call that tin machine <laughs> I know, I remember that and I saw that no, I no, that no, actually not the similar idea it came from the same motivation was to, you know, strip that back down again and uh, yeah. find a new set of rules and I guess it was a kind of rebirth, wasn't it? Yeah, and I think Dogma does much the same thing. I think it's quite interesting what's happening. Uh, what do you think of things like Mike Figgis and Time Code? And all that? I, I like very much that he's, um, uh, he's confronting the form of filmmaking yeah. uh, very aggressively, and he's trying yeah. to break all the borders. Yeah. And uh, he, it's, it's, his work stands from that. Yeah. I, I really like that. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting to see how challenged and inspired he also is from having uh, something to play his ball against if you understand what I mean to be challenged from obstacles yes is, is uh, a main inspiration I guess so do you think that, that this new revolution where does it put people like Tarkovsky and Kislowski and uh, anybody else that ends Way up with E at the end of their name <laughs> you think I don't know do you really think that no I don't know I think um, uh, people like them did the same thing. I, I'm yeah. sure they had a bunch of rules. I'm yeah. actually working with the composer from Kislovsky's film. Right Are now. you really? Yes. And uh, well, from Decalogue or from from also from Decalogue. Well, yes, well, he did almost fantastic. all of his films. Spignev Kreishna is his name. <laughs> Wonderful name. And he's um, stuck with um, rules and yeah and dogma <laughs> uh, in his own way and yeah. I think a lot of artists are framing what they're doing yeah making a set of rules somehow yes they are yeah our rules was invented in half an hour it was not important what was in them it was yeah. just to strip away things a structure was important yeah. well you're saying strip away at one by on one hand but on the other hand you're actually talking about recreating a structure yeah. of, of sorts well, I can tell you... Is that, will that structure... Be, I mean, why, does, why do we have structures as artists, I wonder? Because, you know, is it replacement for things that we feel are lacking in, in, an, in uh, an acceptance of chaos that we're living in? That we, we create a synthetic structure to give us the impression that there's uh, uh, some kind of uh, sense in everything? 
I guess so. And I guess uh, too many options are, uh, that I agree with. are killing everything. I it's agree with that everything. entirely. I mean, Visconti and I, when we were making Heathen, yeah. very much found that what made life more bearable for what we were trying to do was to take away options. Exactly. And, uh, and not go digital on some things. And uh, The smaller the subject you have, the that's smaller right. the uh, yeah. area you can work in, the larger it becomes somehow. It's, it's right. absolutely true. It's absolutely true. I've seen so many people make so many huge mistakes, including myself, when given an enormous budget, for instance, <laughs> and, and everything at your command, you know, sort of... We just, at this, uh, we just felt the budget, limiting the budget, uh, had, you know, the low budget kind of wave was also, had also become uh, a convention. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's a low budget, but anything goes within that low budget. You can have low budget with rules, yeah? Exactly. And that's where dogma comes in. <laughs> exactly. And it was very easy. It was just like saying, what do we normally do? Yeah. Set up lights and then forbid it. Yeah, sure. It was very easy. The, uh, the films that have come through that I've noticed, I, I guess, uh, most obviously over the last couple of years that made sense as a new pattern were things like uh, Memento, um, Pi, probably. Yeah. And, uh, of course, Run, Lola, Run. But that was uh, kind of dubious, I think. Strangely enough, none of them dogma films. No, they? absolutely not. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. What, uh, so, no problem. You know, do you think dogma's been taken seriously overall? Then we'll I, I think so. Like I think the irony has uh, provoked a lot of people in the wrong way, because the irony is just uh, me and Lars being insecure and, and playful. Yeah. Um, but I think it has... Uh, it has created a huge impact on the film society. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of... I like the site as well. What? I like the site, the internet site. is very good, Doug. Isn't it? Yeah, oh, I'll, I'll let them know. They'll, no, they'll it's very good. Very happy. Well, anybody... I mean, anyway, Dogma is five years old now. And yeah. It's becoming, in Denmark at least, its own convention now. Yeah. So it's slowly dying. Established we'll, or establishment? I would say even establishment. It's, wow. You can, you can get Dogma furniture now. In wow. Life. So this is the time, I guess it's the time to, to create another kind of renewal. What do you mean by dogma furniture? You mean furniture which is uh, adheres to a set of rules? Or? I mean that dogma has become an icon of something which is naked and not decorated. Yeah. And yeah. it's being used oh, it's, it's just The word itself is passed into the vocabulary here. Exactly. And uh, it's used to describe things that are so-called inherently have integrity. And, exactly. Yeah. It's, a, it's part of bourgeoisy now. It is a bit, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's no longer rebel. Then you get something the equivalent to the Memphis group or, or whatever in uh, Italy from the 80s who came up with artificiality as being absolutely the way to go. That was like a, a cry against uh, the, the, the residue of Bauhaus and the minimalist movement and all that. And yeah. so people like Ettore Sotsas and all those Italians came up with this thing of putting Fablon uh, with marble, uh, you know, and creating, using the aesthetic of, uh, of the American coffee bar as, the, as how a, a, living, a, a living room should be and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But do you have, I, I guess, I can tell from your... Formica, American. that was their big thing. <laughs> Makes Formica the new now. The new now. The new now. The cards oh. as well. We're being told to. I just, I just have a question actually well, before the cards. I thought we were doing quite well actually. <laughs> Without the cards, well, I guess. We'll, okay. Anyway, um, I guess uh, watching or listening to your records and whatever you've done throughout, um, I see also um, a need to change constantly and to avoid repetition, um, which, which I, so that it's, so that your art becomes fresh and curious and. So yeah. you, that you're on kind of new ground, unexplored territory every time. Well, possibly. I'm not sure. Looking back, you know, from where I am, it does seem to me. Uh, it seems to me that maybe the change is more superficial than than I would have suggested earlier, ten years ago, twenty years ago. It does seem to me that what I probably do is just find a newer way of approaching the same questions because I don't actually think the subject matter that I, I, I write about or sing about or whatever uh, on my albums has ever really changed. It seems to me, looking back, that there's a very common thematic device that runs through everything I've done. Um, 
and it starts with isolation and, and it goes out from there and it gets quite dreary. <laughs> um, but it does seem to be about the same four or five different elements of one's life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and what, what I think the changes are, are more about how I creep up on those questions from a different place each time, you know, how mm -hmm. I can try and repose the questions. Because I, I just know now, obviously, it, it is what I'm going to be writing about to the end of my writing days. I, I, I don't see any changes in, in my subject matter. It will always be fairly dark and a lot of it will be about spiritual abandonment and loneliness and, you know, all these things. Um, but the form around it changes. The form around it changes, exactly, yeah. So the change is only uh, partial. The change is a way of getting into the question yet again mm -hmm. from a different place. But I do see that with a lot of my favorite authors or painters or musicians, they tend to do the same thing. And it becomes clearer as they get older, or as you see more of a body of their work, you start to understand. And I bet that they themselves also start to understand what it is that they write about or do or paint or whatever. Because yeah. I don't really think when you're younger, you have had enough experience of life itself just purely in years of the repetition of working every day and coming to the end of a, bod a piece of work and it adds up to a body of work. I think when you're younger, you don't fully understand the implications of what you're working on. And I think... I can agree Unfortunately, <laughs> the end, or, or towards the end, you do see what you've done and what you've been writing about, and then for time you can go, oh my God, <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> or you can say, yeah, that was worth doing, you know. I'm not at that point yet, so no, don't no. ask me. <laughs> actually, in fact, follow orders and, and grab a car. So here's a subject. This is not a question. Uh, I'll show it to you. Let's try another one. Well, okay. Is that okay with you? Mm-hmm. What about this one? Okay, let's put the two together. Think, think if, if the fool. Think uh, of the fool. Think of the fool. Um... Is it, uh, yeah, is it, uh, can one write uh, um, assuredly from the point of view of an idiot? <laughs> uh, is it true that the fool knows more than if, than, than the complicated and sophisticated man? Is it, you know, does the fool keep pointing out the absurdities of life unwittingly, you know? I don't know. You see, I, I, I guess uh, um, there are people who, who says that there's a direct axis between the fool and and the truth. Yeah, I know. It's it's an interesting one because it. Uh, I think what uh, an example for me would be obviously uh, what's termed outsider art or outsider music in my case. And people like I don't know if you know aware of them. People like Daniel Johnson. Do you know he's an American? No, 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 I'm sorry, no. He's an American artist who is somewhat similar to Brian Wilson in, okay. in as much as there's very childlike qualities in him but he does produce the most extraordinary songs and he's been a very big influence on quite a few artists. Uh, I know that Nirvana liked him very much, strangely enough. Um, there's something about his work which it, it, it seems as though he stumbled a, a, upon a truth of some kind. Um, and I think it's irresistible to believe the idea. I think it's a very pagan thing, isn't it, to want to believe that the fall has a, has a, a kind of a, I think it's a, a straight through line to the truth, whatever it's that It's a dangerous might be. thesis because there's an enormous amount of stupidity around us. Yes, and I it know. Does not encourage, <laughs> it does not encourage people to either read or no. learn, yeah. which is, I guess, uh, uh, out of fashion these days. That sounds interesting. Uh -huh. in, in, Good, I'm glad to hear you say Intelligence, that. Or whatever you? you call that in, in English. Is, How old are you? I'm 33. Are oh, you? big old man now. <laughs> but I do tend to agree with you. And, and I would not think, I, I'm also, I get, it makes me quite angry when I, I see um, the idea of, of the acquisition of knowledge or trying to search out something or being curious or having that great hunger for learning about how life works and how we express ourselves and why and the society we live in and 
all that when that's put down as there's being something too elitist or something you know and it yeah and i think am i becoming you know one of those crotchety old men but then i think no because when i was when i was 20 21 whatever i was the same and it yeah. used to make me so mad when people didn't have any interest seemingly in anything in any about how they lived or where they lived or why they lived and all that and uh my impression is that when you when you were 21 um it was it was something to have knowledge people had respect for that um now becoming something is not knowing something yes it is isn't it uh, with some i think we we should be careful of generalizing i should I, because I, I think there are you know there's an awful lot of uh, uh youngsters that i believe are really working very hard to go against the grain go against that yeah. but uh, certainly as uh, as the the common uh the bible from uh, american media which i do know quite a lot about because i live there they take it as a rule of thumb that ignorance is bliss mm -hmm. and they throw that back at their teenage audience yeah, yeah. whether or not it's entirely true that those teenage teenagers are receptive to that i don't really know but definitely from the media mm -hmm. the message is it's cool to be dumb without doubt it is what they're pushing exactly and i think this is incredibly, incredibly and dangerous how, how is it to live there well i don't live in america i live in new york oh that's right <laughs> it's that's another country yeah and i really do believe that i don't think it's the same as living in america there's certainly a, a kind of a cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism in new york that you wouldn't find in the rest of america but even so it is very insular uh, I think one of the dangers of the American way is that it's America first mm. in everything it does. There is virtually no interest in the ambitions or the feelings or the needs and sensitivities of any other nation. It's all about America first. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of, that's kind of scary, you know, uh, as we know in Europe, and, you know, I think it's one of the major things that makes us resent the Americans so much. It feels as though everything they do is about America only. Only, firstly, bum, 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 you know. And, it's and like, you're being reminded that every morning. And you're being reminded of it constantly. So I think, you know, <laughs> you, you kind of, within a little shell, you kind of rebel against it. I'm not an Americanized person. No, no. I am still very much European, you know, when I'm, I'm living there. And I very quietly try and tell people they're wrong <laughs> about things <laughs> but you have to be so quiet over there <laughs> oh that's right let's try another card <laughs> living in america numbness <laughs> interesting isn't it numbness so this is what we all fear isn't it uh, I think that goes, actually, doesn't it go hand in hand with uh, the last thing we were talking about? And as much possibly the, the why people are so receptive to the idea of, of what's called dumbing down is the, uh, uh, the, the burden of so much information that's available. Again, it's this thing of options, you know. And unless you've been... So simplicity is required for... Uh, or, uh, yeah, somebody helping guide you how you make your options, mm -hmm. how you decide on what things to leave out of your life and what things you bring into your life. That in itself is quite a hard thing to... How do you teach somebody how to assess what is relevant or not relevant to their lives, you know? It's a very difficult thing. And, and I, I think that because of the generation before mine, uh, it, it was the let everything hang out generation, you know, which was kind of scary because what that's done is, is uh, it, it's too inclusive of everything. And I think that uh, a present generation finds it hard to accept all that information, which is readily available 24 hours a day and seems to be, to be an overload. And I think when that happens, you start to not want to know about the past or relate to anything in the past or put it into any kind of order because it, there's just too much of it. How do you know, it's just overwhelming. When you've got three or four letters coming through the letterbox, you can put them into piles and know who the, and then suddenly these letters increase and there's like sackfuls coming through on you. Ah, you're drowning in a mountain of letters. You too many just, options. You just stop trying to put them into any kind of formation, you know, and I think people feel like that a lot. They're drowned in information. 
<laughs> so life is a little bit like art. You don't want too many options. I think so. Um, yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure about running away to the wilderness to find truth either. <laughs> uh, you know, going to absolute the other end. I think the best place to observe ourselves is probably to go to the zoo. Isn't it? <laughs> I think that's where you really find truth, no? I would feel home there. Um, I have, I have, I've been curious. Since you were hanging over my bed for it, as a teenager. <laughs> I was, it must have not been you, one of, but a picture of you. It's, it's not to be one of my drunk weekends. Uh, <laughs> okay. Isn't it? Uh, maybe that was a perfect time. <laughs> <laughs> the days where you were hanging over, not you, but the picture of you were hanging over my bed. Uh, I've been thinking, how can, how can you, how do you make a song? How can you produce that many and th this good songs? Uh, I'm a year, ab about a year about writing a script and, and it seems to be f floating out of you. Um, not only songs, but all kind of uh, impressions and how, how does how, how do you work? I don't know. I've never had a problem specifically with uh, the actual musical side. Um, melody and song form, structure of the actual, the musical structure of, of the thing has never been something that has been, a, a, it does literally seem to flow out of me. I, I, I just don't, I never stop that. So I you mean, sit down and write? I can be with a piano or a, a guitar or some instrument for maybe half an hour and I will find that I'm writing something new, whether I want to or not. I mean, it really, it just seems to be there. It seems to be like a tap in that way. And obviously it's just something that's really deeply within me. But strangely enough, the irony is that it took me a very, very long time uh, when I was young to actually learn how to write songs, how to be a songwriter. I didn't find that anything, I wanted so desperately to make music, to do some kind of theatre form with it, um, and to sing and all those things. I had a natural voice, I could sing a bit, but I didn't think any of the other things came naturally to me. And I really feel that I worked incredibly hard for maybe ten years before I knew how to write songs properly, and I did some ghastly mistakes in, in the beginning, which... Uh, for my vanities, <laughs> are still there, available. Because <laughs> I had the stupidity to record them. But I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't find it easy. I never found it easy when I began. And I just wondered how other people did it. And I, it you find it easy? frustrate me that other people seemed to have this thing where they could just, like, it would just come out of them, you know? And it took... I go through agonies trying to produce a song in that time. Um, now, of course, it's the reverse, and, but I couldn't explain to myself back then how it is I'm doing what I do. Lyric-wise, it's a different thing altogether, I think. If I, if I wasn't so... Uh, if, I wa if I wasn't a, such a prisoner of my own anxieties about things, I, I don't think I would write um, as much. Um, I would probably stay just with instrumentals and things like that. Mm. I think my words are trying, I think the reason that I try even bother with lyrics is that it somehow becomes another way to access those things that bother me, you know? Okay. I think so. I, um, I'm being told that we're supposed to stop. Okay. Can I just ask one last thing? I just need to leave the room with the picture of where, when you sit down and write, can you explain to me where is that? Is there a specific window or do you, is it? Where, what's the actual ritual? It's never, it's never been a location of habit. It's always been different. In fact, uh, I, do, I do look forward and to actually make an effort to find a new geography for where I'm writing. Um, and even if it just means going to a different window in the same house, uh, I, do, I do... I guess, again, it's just to kind of keep refocusing, you know? Because uh, I know I'm going to approach the same subject somehow or other. So I just have to circle, so I, I do have to keep changing the parameters of how I make a song just so that my, my window changes somewhat and okay. it, it's slightly altered, you know. And the ideal, of course, is to change the town. I mean, that is, for me, the ultimate. If I can, like this last album, as you may have read, it, it was done on the top of a mountain, which is, yeah. for me, 
was uh, just the worst possible situation I could have imagined, but it was wonderful. But the actuality of it was it was really majestic and sad and, and pulled all kinds of strings in me. Okay. It really, it really Well, did. you can tell that from a wonderful record. Thank you so much. So we made through three questions. So we need, I'm sorry, we need another 10 hours if that's okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm Thomas. looking forward to hear your concert tomorrow.